Why not change to camels for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment? See how camels agree with your throat. See how mild and good tasting a cigarette can be. We are sorry to interrupt your show with breaking news. A new disease called SARS has emerged. This may be the disease that ends the world as we know it. The causes of SARS, also known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, have been investigated and have been understood to be the following. Caused by a coronavirus, a genus of coronaviridae family, that causes respiratory infections in humans. It is a single-stranded RNA virus affecting humans and animals. Other coronaviruses are known only to cause the common cold. It is hypothesized that the virus evolved from exotic caged animals kept in China, such as the Himalayan palm civets and raccoon dogs, and it seems that individuals working in close contact with confined species have tested positive more often. Adults are more easily infected than children, especially women aged 55 and older. The patients have many symptoms when they are infected by SARS. Reporting from the front lines, a reporter was able to acquire the following account. One of the guests at the same hotel, a 48-year-old Chinese-American businessman, became ill with a high fever, dry cough, and mild sore throat, and was admitted on February 26 to the French hospital in Hanoi. He later was evacuated to Hong Kong, where he died. If you have or have observed the following, please report to a nearby health center. A temperature of 38 degrees Celsius or higher, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or hypoxia, radiographic evidence of pneumonia, respiratory distress syndrome, autopsy findings consistent with pneumonia, or respiratory distress syndrome without an identifiable cause. The epidemics beginning are shrouded in controversy and mistakes. It seems to have started in the Guangdong province of China in November 2002. Despite the disease spreading, the national official did not take the steps to inform the World Health Organization until February of 2003. The delays in the control of the epidemic made its spread easier and the international response slow. The regime has drawn great criticism. The nation responded by issuing an apology. But that was not the only human error leading to the disease's spread. An early electronic warning system tried to inform the World Health Organization's global outbreak and alert response network while monitoring Chinese internet media, but the system's language barrier left it incapable of being easily translated and reported. Not only that, but the system was given very late intelligence, in some cases a month old. The report was not fully released until the 21st of January. New containment procedures and response systems were introduced after these events, but over 2,000 cases had already been reported, claiming over 500 lives. This is not where the mistakes ended, however. The next wave of mistakes came like a riptide. After the death of James Earl Salisbury, an American, the media attention increased and allowed the report of Jiang Yanyong to emerge. The report contained accusatory overtones claiming that the Beijing military hospitals were undercounting their number of cases. The Chinese officials, responding to media pressure, began investigations that revealed a deeply flawed set of problems plaguing mainland Chinese healthcare. <laughs> ...to Canada when a 78-year-old woman returned to Scarborough, Ontario after visiting in Hong Kong where she came into contact with an infected person. Upon returning to Scarborough, the woman developed symptoms and was taken to the hospital. Before the woman was taken to the hospital, she passed the disease on to her son. Upon arriving at the hospital, she waited in the waiting room before being assessed where the airborne disease was allowed to spread to other individuals in the waiting room. When seen by the physician, she was assessed in an open area where the airborne disease was allowed to spread to other patients as well as healthcare workers. The physician charged with assessing the patient believed she was suffering from tuberculosis and began to quarantine and implement tuberculosis protocol. Checks for x-rays and tuberculosis skin samples were taken. The chest x-rays and tuberculosis skin samples came back negative. Unfortunately, before the negative test results came back, the 78-year-old woman had passed away. In order to control the spread of infection, quarantine protocols had to be put into place. Through the two infection stages in Toronto, over 15,000 Torontonians were instructed to participate in voluntary quarantine. Those quarantined were asked to remain inside of their house at all times and were instructed not to have visitors. Those who were asked to be quarantined were those who had A. directly come in contact with an infected person, or B. possibly come in contact with a person who had direct contact with an infected person. As the World Health Organization placed a travel advisory on the City of Toronto,
movement of people into and out of the city began to slow, decreasing the chance of the disease spreading outside of the Toronto area. Of those quarantined, 31.2% were observed to have post-traumatic stress disorder stemming from the fear of infection due to being placed in quarantine. 28.9% of quarantine were observed to have some form of depression upon being removed from the quarantine. Toronto suffered particularly when the epidemic hit, proving the nation to be completely unprepared. Health facilities were rapidly overwhelmed and overcrowded, with the staff desperately trying to get away from the outbreak, going as far as being fired. The Toronto residents found themselves in dire straits as they could not attend their jobs and were left in their houses in quarantine, unable to work and pay for their bills. The city itself also deeply suffered in millions of dollars as the World Health Organization declared a travel advisory that cut tourist attraction of the region. Overall, 438 cases happened, leaving 43 dead in their wake, occurred to the detriment of the Chinese government. Reports poured in demanding to have access to the Hong Kong drainage system, a system that was deeply flawed and seemed responsible for the spreading of the disease and was proved to be dysfunctional when the officials reluctantly released the information. Treatment has been made available. Sadly, no FDA-approved antiviral method of treatment exists. To date, current clinical trials focus on relieving symptoms. Possible treatment mechanisms have been studied since 2003, but no drugs have been considered for preclinical trials. The mechanism is the inhibition of enzyme 3 cl Pro, known to be essential for the viral replication and infection. During the 2003 Hong Kong and Toronto outbreaks, corticosteroids and ribavirin were used. The corticosteroids were found to be somewhat effective, though it was highly dependent on case severity and there were side effects associated with higher doses. Ribavirin was minimally effective regardless of the dose and its use was discontinued. Very recent studies show findings that ticoplanin, an antibiotic agent isolated from the actinoplanes bacteria, can inhibit both the SARS virus and Ebola. In Canada, the lab response to identifying the causative agent involved an alteration in their diagnostic approach. The National Mi Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg became a focal point of lab results and biological specimens. The centralization increased efficiency, but data management infrastructure was not in place to handle the epidemiological needs associated with the outbreak. Retrospective analysis suggested using lapinavir and integrative Chinese and Western medicines that were associated with improved outcomes. In vitro and animal studies have suggested that interferon and monoclonal antibodies might have some effects on the disease. However, data from randomized controls trials are lacking. All of our patients have been previously healthy with no coexisting conditions identified as poor prognostic risk factors. The enormous physical and emotional challenge to frontline healthcare workers throughout the world in late 2002 through to mid 2003. A large percentage of patients, many being healthcare workers themselves, became critically ill. Unfortunately, clinicians caring for these individuals did not have the advantage of previous experience or research data on which to base treatment decisions. As a result, at least early in the outbreak, a best guess approach and anecdotes drove therapy. In many centers, systemic steroids, which carry many potential downsides, became a mainstay of therapy. In this issue of critical care, two groups that have frontline experiences of SARS debate the role of steroids. Let us hope and pray together that we never have the patient population needed to resolve the questions these two sides raise. The 21st century science and communication systems helped in rapidly identifying the SARS virus and providing continuously updated information. Yet it was the 19th century public health tools of case detection and isolation, contract tracing, quarantine and infection control which resulted in the successful containment of SARS. The measures implemented by the countries closely resembled each other and were generally in line with the World Health Organization recommendations. However, differences among the countries were seen in the timelines of implementations and in the mode and extent to which the individual countries went to apply or enforce control measures. Treatment and control guidelines developed and implemented by the Guangdong authorities in January 2003 were good enough to execute elsewhere. Due to different legal and political constraints, this information was not shared with other Chinese provinces and the rest of the world until early April 2003. This facilitated national and international spread and forced affected regions and countries to learn from their own experiences and develop their own measures. After the containment of the disease was accepted in July of 2003, permanent resolutions were made globally to prevent the disease and other cases from ever occurring. Thank goodness this seems to have passed.
Thank you, and you may now return to your program. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby together. We are sorry to interrupt your program with breaking news. A new disease called Ebola has emerged. This may be the disease that ends the world as we know it. Thank <laughs> you.